Okay, this is the first part of a two-part series of just reviewing what we've gone through class so far. So that this, so this is the story so far up to the seventh seal. Now this is going to be very general, a very broad overview. I will be using slides that uh, came out of previous uh, class sessions, but that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to go over those bullet points again. So if this is, uh, if I touch on any areas that uh, you feel like you need a refresher, then my I would highly recommend you go back to that actual class and review the uh, video and the slides and the notes. So, having said that, we are starting with Daniel. And to quote Jesus' own words, let the reader understand, because there is so much to Daniel that is really necessary to understanding end times and revelation. And we started, we, when we did Daniel, we did chapters 2, which was a dream uh, given to Nebuchadnezzar, and then chapters 7, 8, 9, and then 10, 11, 12, which are four visions that were given to Daniel that are of eschatological interest. So, we started in Daniel 2, where a Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. He didn't know what the dream was. He wanted it interpreted. None of his uh, wise men would even attempt to do a dream that uh, even Nebuchadnezzar would not know except for Daniel. God helped it. Daniel through this. And so he interpreted, uh, he, he told Nebuchadnezzar not only what the dream was, but he interpreted it. And Nebuchadnezzar saw a dream, in his dream, a statue with a gold head and uh, silver chest and arms. His belly and thighs were bronze. He had legs of iron. He had feet of iron and clay. And then there was this crushing rock that came and crushed the whole statue down. And so the interpretation that uh, Daniel gave uh, and the interpretation of theologians today, um, well, the head of gold was clearly defined as Babylon. Uh, the the uh, chest and arms of silver clearly defined as the Medo-Persian Empire. The belly and thighs of bronze was clearly defined uh, as uh, the Grecian Empire, and uh, so that was fulfilled by Alexander the Great. But then the legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay, uh, those were more generically just described as future kingdoms that were going to be terrifying and dreadful. And so theologians, most of them today, uh, in fact just about every study Bible out there will say the legs of iron is Rome, and the feet of iron and clay is a restored Roman kingdom. And that's not what we are seeing, uh, not only by meeting biblical requirements, but historical um, as well. So, let's go through this very quickly. The head, the Babylonian Empire, uh, and what you see there in the red dot is, is Babylon and the, the rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. And that is basically what the whole statue is attached to, right? The head. And Nebuchadnezzar was told that his kingdom was going to be overtaken by another kingdom. And that would be uh, the chest and the arms and... Uh, you, you see the second great beast up here. The first, second, third, fourth, these are also uh, uh, what comes out of uh, Daniel chapter 7. So anyway, the chest and arms uh, was the Medio persian As you can see, they clearly uh, overtook uh, not only Babylon, but expanded much, much uh, further, especially to the east. And then the Grecian Empire also expanded even on what the Medio persians had achieved. And so then we come to the, the uh, fourth Iron Legs Kingdom. And uh, this kingdom was supposedly as strong as iron. That is a biblical requirement. They're supposed to be terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. And not only that, but they shall break and crush all that remain from the previous three kingdoms. So the fourth kingdom had to overtake the previous three. 
even though they no longer existed uh, when this prophecy was being fulfilled. So then the question is, you go back and you look at the Babylonian Empire and the Medo-Persian Empire and the Greek Empire, the Fourth Kingdom would have to overtake all of that, right? So does the Roman Empire do that? Not even close. The Roman Empire, uh, even though they were strong uh, and they were you know, obviously around during the time of Jesus Christ, but this was a Eurocentric empire, not a Babylonian-centric empire like the dream. So in other words, it wasn't even attached to the head of the Babylonian ki uh, kingdom. Uh, and not only that, uh, but uh, they were really focused on the Mediterranean and Europe, and uh, they encompassed the whole Mediterranean Sea. So, what about the Ottoman Empire, the Islamic Caliphate. And so we looked in beyond the Roman Empire, and if you notice, the Roman Empire it ended at 476 AD. So well, starting 632 until 1923, the most terrifying, longest-lasting empire in the history of the world was the Islamic Caliphate. And they met all the scriptural qualifications, including that which was terrifying, dreadful and exceedingly strong. So then we looked a little more at the scriptural qualifications. Okay, does it really meet those qualifications? Well, first and foremost, the, whole, the name of Islam itself means submission to the laws of Allah. So that's already talking about an overpowering totalitarian type of um, empire. The Arabs, especially in their first 10 years, they conquered some 36,000 cities or strongholds. They destroyed some 4,000 Christian churches, and they erected some 1,400 Muslim mosques. So this is a very crushing, terrifying force. Uh, the Islamic Caliphate, they dictated the law, the governments, the language, the military, the sexual and hygienic practices to those under its authority. So let's just pick on, on language, for example. Uh, the Roman language was what? Latin. How much Latin did you see in the Middle East? How much Latin do you see uh, uh, recorded in history? Um, hardly none outside of Rome. In fact, in the Middle East, it was what? Aramaic? In Hebrew. Uh, uh, what about the Islamic Caliphate? Well, everywhere they went, they imposed their own language, the Arabic language, on its conquered people. They imposed their religion and culture on those who it, they conquered. The, the Romans, what we found out was that the, they didn't even have their own religion. What they did was they took uh, the Greek gods and put Roman names on it. And then on conquered lands, let's take Israel for example. What did King Herod do? He didn't destroy the temple. He rebuilt it, bigger and better, uh, because he wanted a Herod legacy on uh, supporting the Jewish religion. So um, uh, obviously the Romans did not fill this requirement. The Ottoman Empire... They became one of the largest, most powerful, and longest-lasting empires in the history of the world. Okay, now, what about the Daniel 2 prophecy on feet and toes? Because uh, the, if it was Roman Empire, then you'd have to see a revived uh, Roman Empire. If it was an Islamic Empire, then we'd need to see a revised Islamic Empire because it's going to be this kingdom that's going to be the kingdom of the Antichrist that's going to be destroyed by God. So let's look at it. Uh, the scripture qualifications the, of the kingdom of feet and toes was what? It was partly of potter's clay, partly of iron. It was going to be a divided kingdom. Okay, interesting. And as you saw, the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage. So we're talking mixed marriages here, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. So what all does this mean? How is this fulfilled? Well, you just don't see it in the Roman Empire, but what about the Islamic Empire? All right.
Now, one interesting thing is that this part of Daniel, in fact, from Daniel 2, verse 4, until 7, verse 28, it's all written in Aramaic. It's not even written in Hebrew. The Aramaic word for mix, and you see I got mix bolded in this passage, is Arab. Interesting. The Hebrew equivalent is Arib. Uh, equally interesting. And then we look at the... Um, the beginnings of the Arab people, they were descendants of who? Ishmael and Esau. What did they do? They intermarried among the desert pagan tribes. They became collectively known as the mixed one. Why? Because they mixed with one another in marriage. And this is the origin of the Arabs' present name. The, the, name, the, the name of Arabs today means the mixed desert people. Okay, so that definitely meets the scriptural qualifications. Now, what about the part that they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay? Well, after Muhammad died, there was division uh, because there was two sects in Islam. There was the Shia minority sect, of which Muhammad was from, but it only comprised 14% of all Muslims, and then the Sunnis were the remaining 86%. Now, the Shias, the minority, they believe that, well, obviously, Muhammad was one of us, so uh, the succession of Muhammad needs to follow the bloodline of Muhammad. The Sunnis were like, no way. Uh, we were the loyal follow followers of Muhammad. We were the ones that beckoned to his call. And so if anybody uh, uh, succeeds Muhammad, it's going to be a Sunni. Um, and then, as we know, this resulted in a never-ending bloodshed that's even very alive today, if I could use the word alive, uh, the sectarian violence. So, in summary here, the Islamic Empire uh, is a perfect fit of the Daniel 2, 41-43. And we also discussed in class uh, that uh, uh uh, president Erdogan, the president of Turkey, is doing, trying to do what? He is trying to revive the Islamic Caliphate. The Islamic Caliphate was, dis was basically uh, disbanded uh, and disassembled after the end of World War I. And Turkey definitely wants to see the Islamic Caliphate, the Ottoman Empire, resurrected. And that would meet scriptural prophecy to the T. Okay, now also in, in all this is where is Islam today? Because, or versus where is Rome today? Because if the Roman Empire is prevalent and looks like it's going to be resurrected, then we need to look harder at Rome. If, if the Islamic Empire it looks like it's ready to be resurrected again, uh, especially as a caliphate, then we need to look to Islam. Okay, first and foremost, the mixed marriage, you know, the Sunnis and the Shias, as you see there on the map, the dark green is the Shias, the light green is the Sunnis. That is definitely, definitely a mixed marriage that is not going well with all the sectarian violence. Okay, another thing that we looked at, okay, um, if uh, the countries are Roman, what does God speak of the countries that he's going to come against at the last days versus what are the countries that God's going to come against that might be Islamic in the last days? So we went and looked at those scriptures. We started off in Psalms. The countries that were rising up, that were conspiring with one accord uh, against, against Israel, uh, these were what? Uh, and you see the tents of Edom, Ishmaelites, Moab, so on and so on. But in modern terms, this is Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Golan Heights, Syria, the Sinai Peninsula, the Negev, Gaza, Palestinian Authority, Lebanon, Iran, Iraq. You know what they all have in common? None of them are Roman. They're all Islamic. And then we looked at Ezekiel, where God is going to say, 
uh, wail alas for the day, for that day is near, and that day is the day of clouds and time of doom for the nations. And then he lists them. Cush, Egypt, Put, Lud, Arabia, Libya, modern day, Sudan, Egypt, North Africa, Libya, Turkey. Um, these people have what in common? A hatred for Israel, a hatred for Jews. And oh, by the way, they're all Islamic. We looked at Zephaniah, something very similar, the day of the anger of the Lord. And then it started, the Lord started to tell who he was going to destroy. And he mentioned uh, everything that you see bolded there from Gaza to Ashkelon, Ekron, on and on. And uh, does this add any extra countries? I think it uh, added Nineveh, which is Mosul today in modern Iraq. Once again, all of these countries are Islamic. So once again, Scripture, if we let Scripture interpret Scripture, we see that it starts lining up that the, the, the legs of iron, the feet of iron and clay, is scripturally being fulfilled by Islam. Okay, well, what about the Islamic countries today? Are they around, or is it Roman uh, colonies, uh, you know, like, a, like the old British colonies? Well, let's look. Here are the Islamic countries today. And what do these countries uh, surround? That little bitty country there of Israel. So, once again, everything is lining up. That it is Islamic countries, not Rome, that will be uh, the kingdom of the Antichrist. So then we looked at Daniel 7, and this was a vision of uh, four great beasts. The first one was like a lion with eagle's wings. That was Babylon. Second one was like a bear, but it had three ribs in its mouth, and that would be Babylonia, Media, and Persia, of the Medio Persian Empire. And then we saw the leopard with four wings and four heads, and so this was Alexander the Great, the Grecian Empire, his four generals uh, with the four heads. And then there was the fourth king beast, right? Terrifying, dreadful, exceedingly strong, with great iron. Uh, teeth and then also it had 10 horns and then there was another horn a little horn uh, that turned out to be the antichrist and then there was three horns that were locked off well they had a disagreement with the antichrist so this is basically what the vision an artist rendition of uh, the vision that daniel saw and we're not uh, going to focus on the first three because they're historically fulfilled it's the fourth one that's the kingdom of the antichrist and it's this fourth beast that was exceedingly terrified. And, um, and also we had the ten horns and the little horn. But this little horn did what? The Antichrist, the little horn, made war with the saints. Okay, so what? It prevailed over them. Wow. Until... The Ancient of Days came, so that would be uh, God the Father. And judgment was given in favor of what? The saints of the Most High. And the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom of God. And then we looked a little bit in the Revelation. Of, well, what Are we seeing ten horns and three being lopped off? And, and uh, is there any resemblance of this in Revelation? And, and we looked and saw, oh my goodness, all over the place. Ten horns, seven heads, ten diadems, ten kings, uh, ten horns. Uh, it just went on and on. Then we went to Daniel 8. And Daniel 8 uh, is another important uh, vision. It explained the rise of the medial Persian Empire once again. The ram with two horns. It, told, it explained Greece. Uh, Alexander the Great, uh, the, the kingdom that was overtaken by his four generals. And then we get to verse 9, where out of one of them, one of the horns, the Antichrist will, will come, which is telling us that first and foremost, the Antichrist is going to come out of one of these four horns, which was the kingdoms that was um, overtaken by the four generals. 
of Alexander the Great. But out of this came the little horn, the Antichrist. And this, the Antichrist, as, as we know in Daniel, grew great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the glorious land, which is Israel. And then he took away the regular burnt offering, uh, and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. This is the abomination of desolation the, in the temple, uh, the third temple in Jerusalem. And then in verse 12, it says, And a host will be given over to it, together with the regular burnt offering. Why? Because of transgression. And it will then, it, the Antichrist is going to throw truth to the ground, and it will act and prosper. And this would be the great tribulation and Jacob's trouble. Another way of reading verse 12 is, Because of their sins, the Jewish people, which were the host of Jerusalem, and the temple, and their temple will be given over to the Antichrist. And then we heard angels talking to angels and asking the question, how long is this vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, the giving over of the sanctuary? Um, and he said, 2,300 evenings and mornings. And then the sanctuary will be restored to its rightful state. So whether it's 2,300 days or more likely 2,300 evenings and mornings, uh, so that divided into twos, 1,150 days, a little over three years. The literal Hebrew here reads evening, morning, 2,300. So this kind of helps us understand the challenges of trying to interpret this at times. And then he goes on and says, understand, O son of man, the vision is what? It wasn't fulfilled with Antioch Epiphanes. It wasn't fulfilled uh, with uh, Titus and the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. The vision is for the time of the end. It refers to the appointed time. Okay, so that leaves no wiggle room uh, for anything other than than the end of times. Yes, we have in typical prophet, in prophecy fulfillments that are type and shadows like Antioch, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes or the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. But that's not the point. The point is the prophecy is for the time of the end. And then it went and explained the kings, the horns, uh, uh, Media, Persia, Greece, Alexander the Great, and uh, his generals. Verse 23, and then once again at the latter end of their kingdom. What's their kingdom? Now he's talking about the four generals. And uh, out of the four generals, there were two in particular, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies, that um, really prosper. And so you see the Seleucid up to the north. Take close note of that. You see Israel in black, take note of that, and the Ptolemy Empire, uh, which uh, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes came from, who was, by the way, he was Syrian. And take note of all of that. So anyway, at the, at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, so what we're talking about is the latter end of these, of what had been these kingdoms when mankind, the transgressors, the sins of mankind have reached their limit, what's going to happen? There's going to be a new king on the block, a king of bold face, the Antichrist, who, once again, he's going to come out of one of these two kingdoms, who understands riddles and shall rise. He will not rise on his own power. Even though his power will be great, it will be given to him. Hmm. We read that in Revelation. And he shall cause fearful destruction. Hmm. We read about that in Revelation. And shall succeed in what he does and what? Destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. And this is talked about by Jesus in the Olivet Discourse in Revelation and obviously uh, prophesied in Daniel among other places. Ezekiel and um, 
Isaiah definitely come to mind as well as Deuteronomy. Joel, it just goes on and on, Amos. So verse 25, by his cunning he shall make deceit prosper under his hand. So he's going to uh, be successful in his in a season. And in his mind, he's going to be great. And then without warning, he's going to destroy many. That's going to be Christian martyrs. That's also going to be uh, Jewish people, Jacob's trouble. And he shall even rise up against the Prince of Princes, the Messiah. So he thinks he's great. But he shall be broken, but not by any human hand, which is the stone in Daniel 2. And the vision of evenings and mornings, Daniel's told is sealed up because it refers to many days from now, that being the end of times. And then we get to Daniel 9, the 77s, and this is just a monumental, mind-blowing uh, prophecy and vision given to uh, Daniel. Uh, Daniel had been praying and fasting uh, and repenting of the sins of his nation, and then what? He's visited by the angel Gabriel. And he's told in Daniel uh, 9, verse 24, that Daniel, 77s are decreed for your people. So that would be the Jews, and your holy city, that would be Jerusalem. And then he gives this amazing prophecy, which is the new covenant, which is the coming of God's kingdom. What's going to happen at the end of of all this to finish transgression to end all rebellion and revolt against God to put an end to sin an end to sin to atone for wickedness so no longer animal sacrifice but there's going to be a permanent atonement for all wickedness to bring in everlasting righteousness not just righteousness for a season everlasting to seal up the vision and prophecy, which is going to be fulfilled in Revelation, and to anoint the most holy place. The temple will be anointed into what its original intention has always been, and that is God's dwelling place, his throne room, his temple. And so then he goes on, and he starts to explain the 77s, and, he's, and he tells Daniel, that uh, there's going to be a decree that go out and restore and rebuild Jerusalem, which was uh, fulfilled by Antiochus uh, in uh, 444 B.C. And until that decree, until the anointed one, the anointed one is the, in Hebrew is what? Mashiach, the Messiah. The anointed one, the ruler, and so the time from the decree until the, the Messiah comes, there's what? There's going to be seven sevens and 62 sevens, so that's going to be 49 plus 434 years, which is 483 sabbatical years, because these are lunar uh, years, which takes us into March 30th, 33 AD, which is pretty much what everybody uh, that has done, the, the math and all this, say that this is when Jesus uh, rode in on a donkey, into Jerusalem to celebrate his last Passover. And then it, Jerusalem, is going to be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble during Roman occupation. And then after all this, 62 sevens, the anointed one is what? He's going to be put to death. So that's the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Uh, and he will have nothing. Uh, and Jesus was believed to be crucified three days later, April 3rd, 33 AD. And then comes verse, the middle of verse 26. And then this verse is monumental because this is the verse that the theologians focus in on and say, no, it's always been wrong. And verse 26 proves it because the people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And they're saying, well, first of all, let's put this in a little uh, more clear terms, but they're saying the people of the ruler, that's, that was the Romans, so get over it. It's Roman occupation. It was a Roman decision to destroy the temple. So it's the, the, the resurrected kingdom will be Roman. Well, we, we looked into that. And we looked at the, the Hebrew words, the people. Actually, the Hebrew meant either a race or an ethnic group. So 
Arabs fit definitely into that definition of the ruler. Well, the ruler, yes, the ruler could be the very top Caesar from, uh, from Rome, but also the name, uh, the Hebrew word also meant a commander. It could be a captain. It could be a civilian leader, military, or religious. But, uh, but this captain or leader will, uh, will come from this ethnic group called the people. And the people of the ruler who will come, that would be the Antichrist and his kingdom, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. So, we looked at a couple of uh, historical uh, records uh, from uh, this historian in, uh, of the Roman Empire. He basically said that there's a strong contingent of Arabs in the Roman legions, and these Arabs hated the Jews with usual hatred of neighbors. So in other words, they were the neighbors and they hated Israel and the Jewish people. And from Josephus, uh, basically, he, he recorded the night of the temple fire where Titus came in and ordered everybody, ordered his officers, ordered the, the soldiers to quench the fire. But what? It's recorded that their passions were too hard for the regards they had for Caesar, they being the foot soldiers, and the dread they had for Caesar, who forbade them. But what was greater than that was their hatred of the Jews and a certain vehement inclination to fight them, the Jews, too hard for them also. And thus was the holy house, the temple, burnt down without Caesar's approbation. So who was the ethnic group that was responsible for, for uh, destroying the temple? Who was the ruler, the captains that... Uh, uh, that were that were trying to uh, destroy the temple. It was the Arabs. And then also, is there any other prophecies that kind of agree with this? Yes, Isaiah chapter ten verses twenty to twenty-five. It's there for you to read. But listen to this: uh, In that day, the remnant of Israel um, will no more, no more lean on him, the Antichrist who struck them but they're going to lean on the Lord. And then there's going to be a remnant that returns. And we read, remember Zechariah, that's going to be only one-third of what's left to God. Um, and although there's many, many Israelites, only a remnant of them will return. And God said what? Why is this? Because destruction is decreed. And this is a decree that's coming from righteousness. This is God's decree. For the Lord God of hosts will make a full end as decreed in the midst of all the earth. And therefore, what does God say? Uh, o people who dwell in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrians when they strike. Wow. That just further cements that it's not the Roman Empire that's, that's resurrected. It is uh, an Islamic uh, caliphate, a revision of the Ottoman Empire, and uh, there, it will be led by somebody called the Antichrist that has Syrian heritage in his bloodline. And then, of course, the, the remainder of uh, Daniel chapter 9, the end's going to come. The end's going to come like a flood. War will continue. Uh, desolations have been decreed. Uh, he, the Antichrist, will confirm a covenant with many. And we talked about what that could possibly be. It could be, nothing, it could be something as simple as nothing more than just recognizing that, it, that the Israelis do actually have historical claim to the to uh, to the temple to the temple mount to Jerusalem because right now they deny all of that uh, for one seven so this once again we're in the last seven years before the end of times and in the middle of the seven three and a half years in what he's gonna he the Antichrist will put an end to sacrifice and offering that will be the abomination of of desolation that's spoke of by Jesus in the Olivet Discourse. 
until the end that's decreed, it's poured out, which uh, we read in Revelation, seven bowls of God's wrath will be poured out. And then we came to Daniel 10 and 12, and these three chapters are a single vision concerning the future. Starts off with a, uh, a battle going on in the spiritual kingdoms where the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood this angel coming to report to Daniel. But Michael, the archangel, came to help. Um, and then what? To understand what is to happen to your people, the Jewish people, in the latter days. So once again, there's no wiggle room for historical Fulfillment, as so many theologians and, uh, and preterists will, will say, is for the latter days. And the vision is for the days yet to come. And then we start off in chapters 11 and 12, future events related to the Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Egypt uh, versus Syria, or the Ptolemies versus the Seleucids. And then starting in verse 21, this is the heart of this vision. The final great tribulation, the emergence of the little horn, the Antichrist, before the tribulation. It also details his conquest during the tribulation and details Israel's deliverance and resurrection after the tribulation. And then it, in chapter 12, it gave, gives further details of the tribulation. So, we got verses 5 through 20, which once again, we're, we're talking about the kings of the north and the kings of the south, and it goes back and forth, and uh, it, it talks about uh, uh, what happens, which is a type and foreshadow of, uh, fulfilled by Antiochus Epiphanes. But once again, remember what this is about. This is what is to happen to the, your people in the latter days, and so that's very, very important. And then once again, this kind of gives... A map helps us get a picture of, of the kings of the north and the kings of the south and what's going to happen in the end of days. Look at those countries, include Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is a standalone and it's for a very big, big reason, which we'll talk about in a future class. Uh, but look at those and watch those players and play in the future. Then we get, now we get to verse 21. Okay, this is where it all really, really starts. In his place, in his place. Now we're talking coming out of uh, either the, the kingdom of the north or the kingdom of the south. Shall rise a contemptible person to whom royal majesty has not been given. We've already read prophecies about this, right? He shall come in without warning and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Uh, armies shall be utterly swept away before him and broken. Why? Because he's given power. Uh, even the prince of the covenant, so even Israel, and the, from the time that an alliance is made with him, so that would be uh, the covenant, uh, he shall act deceitfully and shall become strong with a small people, so it would be small neighboring nations, no, nothing big like Russia or China. And then without warning, he shall come into the richest parts of the province. So that what is that? I don't know. It could be Saudi Arabia. It could be Kuwait. Uh, who knows? And he shall do, well, maybe we do know, but we're not going to get there yet. And he shall do what neither his fathers nor his fathers have done, and scattering among them the plunder and spoil. Um, he shall devise plans against strongholds, but only for a time he shall stir up his power and his heart. What motivates the Antichrist in all this? It's not greed, it's not power, it's not territory, it's hatred. Hatred towards the Israelis, hatred towards God's covenant, hatred towards the, the Jewish people, hatred uh, against Christians. And he'll stir his heart up against the king of the south, and then they'll go back and forth. Uh, the king of the south is, is going to lose the battle here. And once again, this kind of gives you the theater. And then verse 31, forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and the fortress. So in other words, when the Antichrist comes in and invades Jerusalem, he shall what? Take away the regular burnt offering and shall set up the abomination that makes, uh, uh, that makes desolate, talked about by Jesus Christ. Okay. 
and he shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant. So the fellow Arabs, uh, he will seduce them to be part of his uh, army. But the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. In verse 33, very important. The wise among these people shall make many understand. So there's going to be wise men that, have, that know the prophecy, that know the Lord, that are going to help people cope and understand what's going on here. All right? Uh, this is one reason why it's so important to study Revelation. Uh, though for some days they shall stumble by sword and flame, by captivity and plunder, so they will become martyrs as well. Um, at that time, now Michael is arising, the great prince. And if we, if we read in, Daniel, in uh, Revelation 12, what? There's a war between Michael and his angels that threw out the, uh, Satan and his angels, um, the, the dragon, and it, down to earth. That hasn't happened yet, but Daniel has already said at that time. At that time is going to be Revelation chapter 12. Uh, and there shall be a time of trouble, the great tribulation, as Jesus almost quoted, says, such as never has been since there was a nation until that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. This will be the end of Jacob's tribulation where the third is, is refined and they will call, look upon the Lord their God and upon Yeshua as their Messiah everyone's whose name found in, written in the book. All right? And then many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake. This is the resurrection and the rapture. So after all this tribulation that we, we just talked about in, in uh, earlier verses, now we got the resurrection. We got the rapture. And the resurrection, there's two of them because there's some to everlasting life. There's the second resurrection some to shame and everlasting contempt, which will be revealed in the great white throne judgment. Verse 11, And from the time the regular burnt offering is taken away, and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, how long is that? 1,290 days, just three and a half years plus 30 days. And blessed is he who waits and arrives at 1,335. Now, what is that about, too? Okay, um, it's not really said, but we are given a hint. Uh, who waits and arrives at the 1335 means that they're arriving probably to some kind of event, most likely a formal event. Could be a coronation of Jesus as the millennial king, marriage of the lamb, marriage supper. Uh, and that would explain why it needs an extra 45 days. Okay, so we're going to end part one there. And then we will continue... Uh, we'll be back to Revelation chapter 6 and the opening of the 6th.